Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti. Eminenza reverendissima, eccellenze, signori ambasciatori, magnifico rettore della Università e decano della Facoltà di Scienze Sociali, professori, alunni della Facoltà e dell'Università, signore e signori. È per me è un grande onore dare l'avvio ai lavori di questo convegno internazionale che ha per tema sviluppo umano integrale, sfide alla sostenibilità e alla democrazia. Mi è grato il compito di annunciare questo convegno internazionale come il sesto, dal lontano 2003, nella ormai consolidata teoria dei convegni internazionali, organizzati come attività del seminario permanente Giuseppe Vedovato sull'etica nelle relazioni internazionali, affidato alla Facoltà di Scienze Sociali. Vedovato credo sia di utilità rammentarlo, il suo busto sta a Strasburgo, tra i grandi d'Europa. E proprio sei anni fa, come oggi qui, il senatore Vedovato, quando mancavano pochi mesi ai suoi cento anni, fece la sua ultima relazione ancora senza occhiali, quindi proprio come oggi, sei anni fa, facevamo questo convegno. Non mi rimane altro che dirvi che questo convegno intende celebrare i 50 anni della Popolorum Progressio, incifica sullo sviluppo dei popoli di Paolo VI del 26 marzo 1967 e la creazione del nuovissimo di Castero per il servizio dello sviluppo umano integrale che ha come presidente sua eminenza il cardinale Peter Tuxon. Nello spirito del convegno si vogliono coniugare tre concetti, sviluppo integrale, sostenibilità e democrazia. Mi si consenta alla fine di ringraziare il decano con i membri della segreteria prontata per il convegno che tanto si sono adoperati per la sua organizzazione. Il professor Fernando della Iglesia Vigristi, il dottor Danilo Turco, mentre di nuovo ringrazio sua eminenza, le eccellenze, i signori ambasciatori, il rettore magnifico e tutti voi che onorate il convegno con la vostra presenza. Ora diamo la parola al rettore magnifico della Gregoriana. Prego. Eminenza, signori ambasciatori, illustri ospiti, cari professori, cari studenti, signore e signori. Sono molto lieto di dare oggi il benvenuto a tutti i partecipanti a questo convegno internazionale Sviluppo Umano Integrale Sfide alla Sostenibilità e alla Democrazia. Saluto tutti i relatori, i partecipanti e in un modo molto particolare saluto sua eminenza il Cardinale Peter Turkson, prefetto del Dicastero per il Servizio dello Sviluppo Umano Integrale, che molto gentilmente ha accettato il nostro invito per tenere la relazione introduttiva. Questo convegno è organizzato dalla Facoltà di Scienze Sociali della Pontificia Università Gregoriana nell'ambito del seminario permanente Giuseppe Vedovato sull'etica nelle relazioni internazionali. E questo ci dà l'opportunità di evocare la figura del senatore Vedovato, insigne accademico e uomo politico, nato a Greci il 13 marzo 1912 e morto a Roma il 18 gennaio 2012. Professore universitario, deputato e senatore, Giuseppe Vedovato fu un interveniente attivo nella scena internazionale, in vari continenti, ma soprattutto in Europa. Infatti, alla costruzione europea ha dato il meglio della sua competenza e delle sue capacità, in modo particolare nell'Assemblea parlamentare del Consiglio d'Europa. Profondamente sensibile all'importanza della promozione dei valori etici di matrice cristiana, il senatore Vedovato ha stabilito un rapporto speciale con l'Università Gregoriana, alla quale ha lasciato un importante patrimonio librario di circa 40.000 volumi, oggi integrati nella Biblioteca dell'Università, nel Fondo Vedovato e nella Biblioteca Europea Giuseppe Vedovato. Il senatore Vedovato ha anche lasciato alla Gregoriana i mezzi necessari per portare avanti un seminario permanente sull'etica nelle relazioni internazionali, nell'ambito del quale è nata la serie di convegni in cui si inserisce il convegno che oggi si apre. Sono convinto che Giuseppe Vedovato sarebbe molto soddisfatto 
della tematica e del programma di questo convegno. Infatti, l'espressione sviluppo umano integrale sintetizza in tre parole il meglio che possiamo desiderare per il presente e il futuro dell'umanità. Dall'altra parte, l'etica nelle relazioni internazionali è un fattore decisivo e indispensabile nel portare avanti questo desiderio di uno sviluppo umano che tenga in considerazione la dignità di ogni persona e di ogni società. Ringrazio quindi la Facoltà di Scienze Sociali e il suo decano, padre Iachino Azestop, per la fedeltà con la quale hanno interpretato e attualizzato in beneficio di tutti noi il pensiero e i sogni del senatore Vedovato. E a tutti voi, relatori partecipanti, rinnovo il mio sentito ringraziamento per la vostra presenza e impegno. Grazie. Ringraziamo il Padre Rettore per il saluto che ha dato a tutti noi e naturalmente passiamo la parola al decano della Facoltà di Scienze Sociali, Professor Giacchino Azeso. Prego. Cari studenti e colleghi docenti dell'Università Gregoriana, quest'anno il tema del convegno è lo sviluppo umano integrale, sfida, sfida alla sostenibilità e alla democrazia. Tale tematica punta a celebrare tre eventi. Il primo è il cinquantesimo anniversario dell'enciclica Populorum Progressio di Papa Paolo VI alla quale durante lo scorso anno accademico la Facoltà di Scienze Sociali ha dedicato un corso annuale interessandosi allo sviluppo integrale. Il secondo riguarda la creazione del Dicastero per lo sviluppo umano integrale attraverso la lettera apostolica di Papa Francesco del 17 agosto 2016 in forma di motu proprio, umana, umana progressionem. Il nuovo di Castero è particolarmente competente nelle questioni che riguardano alle, alle migrazioni, ai bisogni, ai bisognosi, agli ammalati, agli esclusi, agli immaginati, alle vittime dei conflitti armati e delle catastrofi naturali. Il terzo è la pubblicazione dell'enciclica Laudato Si. Anche se abbiamo esaminato spesso e da diversi punti di vista questa enciclica con i nostri studenti, pensiamo che sia importante studiare di nuovo quest'opera magna considerando la complessità del mondo in cui viviamo. A nome della Facoltà di Scienze Sociali vorrei ringraziare tutti i partecipanti di questo convegno e tutti i nostri studenti. Pensiamo anche a tutti i relatori, sia quelli che insegnano qua alla Gregoriana e quelli che sono da venuti da fuori. Rivolgiamo i nostri saluti anche ai membri del corpo diplomatico e a tutte le autorità accademiche presenti. Infine, un saluto speciale è rivolto alla sua eminenza, la quale, con la sua presenza, ha accettato di onorare questo convegno vedovato 2017. Quando abbiamo pensato di organizzare il convegno, abbiamo contattato la sua eminenza e lei ha detto subito di sì. Desidero ringraziarla ancora una volta di più a nome della Facoltà di Scienze Sociali e assicurarle il nostro massimo impegno e la nostra più sincera collaborazione 
nell'incarica che Papa Francesco le ha affidato per lo sviluppo umano integrale. Quest'anno, alla fine di questo mese, inizieremo un laboratorio di ricerca e di innovazione sociale. È proprio in questo laboratorio che noi ci impegneremo per capire le dinamiche endogene e exogene che impattano e fa o favoriscono lo sviluppo umano integrale. Auguro a tutti voi di trascorrere un'esperienza un proficua nella nostra università e vi ringrazio ancora per essere qui. Grazie mille. Grazie al padre decano della Facoltà di Scienze Sociali. Presentiamo adesso il suo eminenza il cardinal Peter Turkson, notissimo evidentemente a livello internazionale. Papa Giovanni Paolo II lo ha innalzato alla dignità cardinalizia nel concistoro del 21 ottobre del 2003. Il 24 ottobre del 2009 Papa Benedetto XVI lo ha nominato presidente del Pontificio Consiglio della Giustizia e della Pace sostituendo nell'incarico il dimissionario cardinale Renato Raffaele Martino che lui personalmente ha partecipato e ci ha onorato quattro volte in quattro occasioni per i congressi del seminario vedovato. Nel 2015 ha collaborato alla stesura della seconda encilica di Papa Francesco, Laudato Si. Come sapete, dall'anno scorso, ma dal primo gennaio di quest'anno, è prefetto del Dicastero per il servizio dello sviluppo umano integrale. Permetto di citare alcuni articoli di questo, dello statuto di questo di Castero per dire quanto il Cardinale a sua eminenza si adoperi proprio in questi campi previsti da Papa Francesco e stilati nello statuto. Si tratta, dal numero uno, di lavorare per la giustizia e per la pace, incluso le questioni che riguardano le migrazioni, la salute, le opere di carità e la cura del creato. Il secondo punto dello Statuto dice che il Di Castero promuove lo sviluppo umano integrale alla luce del Vangelo e nel solco della dottrina sociale della Chiesa. Finalmente il terzo punto dello Statuto sottolinea la sollecitudine del Sommo Pontefice verso l'umanità sofferente, tra cui i bisognosi, i malati, gli esclusi, e segue con la dovuta attenzione le questioni attinenti alla necessità di quanti sono costretti ad abbandonare la propria patria o ne sono privi, gli emarginati, le vittime dei conflitti armati, delle catastrofi naturali, i carcerati, i disoccupati e le vittime delle forme contemporanee di schiavitù, di tortura e le altre persone la cui dignità è a rischio. E proprio in questo campo si muove da par suo, sua eminenza. Per questo lo ringraziamo e anche per l'onore che fa di stare in mezzo a noi. Grazie. La parola a sua eminenza. Grazie, professor Bondoratore. Uh, innanzitutto chiedo scusa per il piccolo ritardo, che è bello inglese o italiano. Poi ho alcune cuffie e vorrei darvi un po' di, un po di uh, due minuti di riposo. So let me switch wavelengths and come to English so you can take off your earphones. Okay, you see a lot of people taking them off. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I just wish to apologize uh, for having gotten here uh, slightly late. Uh, we happen to be taking care of uh, doing a conference in the, in the Vatican on trade unions. And so, uh, we have to shuttle between that and coming here. So, my apologies for uh, coming late. So, dear Rector, <coughs> Your Excellencies, uh, dear Dean, Professors, and all of you dear participants, I wish you again a very good morning, and I trust you had a nice evening and had a good breakfast to be here. Uh, I wish to start by thanking the Rector of the Pontifical Gregorian University for this invitation. My predecessor, Cardinal Martino, did the Vedovato lectures four times. This is my second time, so I'll probably catch up. I'm not sure, but we'll see. We'll see. The first one was on solidarity. 
And this second one is about integral human development. So I wish to thank uh, you all for the invitation for this invitation. This year, we celebrate, as you know, the 50th anniversary of Blessed Paul, the Pope Paul, the sixth landmark and cyclical Poplum Progressio. And the celebration of that coincided with the inauguration of our dicastery, which we try to do in a grand form at the beginning of the year. Invited this morning here in your midst to briefly share thoughts uh, about integral human development, especially theoretical approaches, philosophy, and challenges. I wish to start this way by first interrogating myself about what integral human development is, seeing that it's not only the church that talks the language of development. The UN also talks the language of development. You know the UNDP, Development Program. You know about the MDGs that have come and gone, Millennium Development Program. And now we're dealing with the SDGs, uh, Sustainable. De so several institutions around us are talking a lot about development. And the church is also talking development. And that is a concept that comes strongly from the encyclical we'll be looking at this morning. So what is it? What is integral human development? Incidentally, not everybody understands the concept. Some do not take into account its deep anthropological basis, and many neither acknowledge nor face the many challenges that the service of integral human development entails. I'm sure that the international conference that we begin in this morning Integral Human Development Challenges to Sustainability and Democracy would, would enable all of us to enter into this concept a little bit more uh, deeply and live here at the end of this conference with a clear, some clear sense of, of, of the sense of integral development. The service of integral human development, theoretical approaches, philosophy, and challenges as I've been invited to address uh, by the organizers would make me want to begin with the examination of the evolution of the concept of integral human development. Then I shall try briefly to reflect on the philosophical underpinnings of this expression and then look at a few challenges that result from it. So, the evolution of the concept of integral human development. As I said, development has so very many senses and there are so very many ways that people think about it. And in turn, it leads to very different socioeconomic and political points of view. The core problem with the concept of development is that it remains very underdeveloped. The concept of development itself is very much underdeveloped. And uh, for a long time, it has suffered this state of underdevelopment, allowing it to be used every now and then in different contexts. Secondly, for us as a church, it is also important to recognize the difference sometimes between development and progress. We sometimes inter interchangeably use the two words, but to some extent, again, in some depth, there is some slight difference between the sense of development and the sense of progress. Progress is more movemental, progredire, so you're moving. And if at, the, if at the end of the movement, the subject making the progress changes, then we cannot talk about development because they will be talking about a new subject. So progress supposes that, and if the subject that begins the movement remains the same subject at the end of it, then we can talk about a real experience of progress. But if the subject should change in the course of the movement, then the sense of development becomes a little bit different. But we, interuse, we, inter, we interchangeably use the two expressions. Let me get into uh, uh, the development of this within our own household, within the church. The over, overarching belief that guided modern economic system was the physical ob uh, objects are merely resources to be used for human consumption. 
It is a perception that continues to condition contemporary social values and thinking. As nations and societies come to be valued in terms of GNDP, GNP, gross national product, and the development is seen in terms of capacity to exploit, to utilize the resources of the earth. So the ravaging consequences of this on the planet in modern economy does not spare even the human beings and their bodies, seen like the rest of the natural world only as resources for utility and for profit. Despite its benefit on health, infrastructure, mobilization, and communication, among others, the model of development has also led, this model of development is also led in its, in its work to increasing and increasing inequality and serious environmental damage. So a model of development that prevails that is basically economically centered and based on use and transformation of resources has a kind of shortcoming in its sense. For these reasons, alternative models of development have sprung up around, especially beginning from the 1970s, but for us as a church already from the 1960s. And this is what I shall, I shall try to trace with you. The church also got involved in the transformation of the sense of development already from the Second Vatican Council. It was Pope John XXIII who began this move with the introduction of the idea of integral human development in the magisterium of the Pope's act, uh, which began uh, with his encyclical, uh, 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 with his uh, uh, writing, Martel et Magistra. In that he said, people responsible for public authority must have a, very, a valid conception of the common good to promote and implement the sum of those conditions which permit and foster in human beings the integral development of their person. And this was already Martel et Magistra, paragraph 51. Accordingly, John, the Pope John XXIII went on to say that Christian education must therefore be integral. That is, it must extend to each series of duties, and therefore it must also engender the strengthening in the faithful of a sense of carrying out duties and social and, econo of the social and economic character in a Christian way. After John the 23rd, of course, then he started and he opened the Second Vatican Council. And the big document, God you may express the church in the modern world, continues the thinking of, uh, of Pope John the 23rd. In a very succinct way, the council father described the context in which the church is called to act, namely the profound changes, hopes and anxieties, imbalances, hatred, bitterness, inadequate institutions of doubt and all. And so the council fathers to address these, the, the, the document Guardium Express affirmed, the concept of integral human development needs to be embraced. And the council fathers used this expression several times in this document. Paragraph 11, 35, 57, 61, start talking profusely about integral human development as Pope John the 23rd has done. And this presented as a vocation which corresponds to God's will for each person. Accordingly, the document proposed that human culture must be subordinated to the integral development of the human person, to the good of the community and of the whole of humankind. John the 23rd began the council, but Paul the VI concluded it. And so for Paul the VI, takes up the same idea in Populum Progressio. But it is interesting to know the setting of Populum Progressio. This is in 67. And you recall that the 60s were the year of decolonization. This was when a lot of countries were becoming independent, especially on the continent of Africa. Therefore, caught in this period of experience of you know, independence and a lot of nations emerging, 
the challenge of development became very persistent and very constant with Pope Paul VI. Secondly, with his travel around the world, he referred to himself as the ambassador of the poor, having a message to address to for the alleviation of poverty. So for this morning, I just wish to recall the setting of Populum Progressio, the issue of development which Pope Paul the Six addresses is necessary and is worth being set in the context of a world which is witnessing a lot of emerging independent states, a lot of countries becoming independent, beginning to grapple with how they will develop and how they will you know, embrace their national lives. So in this regard, uh, in the time of, the, of, the, of, of Pope, uh, Paul VI's uh, composition of uh, uh, Populorum Progressio, following after Rerum Novarum of Pope Leo XIII, Pope Paul speaks at the beginning of Populorum Progressio about Africa, Latin America, and India, and refer to how he played the advocate of the poor before the United Nations. Right from the start, Pope Paul VI never ceased to address a solemn appeal for a concerned action for the integral development of the human person and the development of the whole of humankind. Paragraph 5. It was in the context of this that he wrote, development cannot be limited to mere economic growth. To be authentic, it must be well-rounded, it must foster the development of each man and of the whole of the human person. And Father Lebre, and as consultant that the council explained, we cannot allow economics to be separated from the, hu from the human and the development of civilizations where it belongs and where it fits. What counts for us is the human person and each human person and each group of persons to include the whole of humanity. And so between the Pope who opened the Second Vatican Council and the Pope who closed that council, an idea about the development and the flourishing of the human person is born, which would be developed and built upon by subsequent Popes to feed into the creation of the new dicastery now for the promotion of integral human development by Pope Francis. A holistic approach to the development of the human person covers all aspects of life, social, economic, political, spiritual, cultural, and personal, and it extends to all persons and to all generations. Therefore, as Pope Francis would affirm several years later, 50 years later, Integral human development must be rooted in the right to life and more generally in what we could call the right to existence of human nature itself. After Pope Paul VI comes Pope John Paul II. For Pope John Paul II, development cannot be reduced to mere economic growth, turnover, and consumption. Therefore, in Solicitudo Rei Socialis, Pope John Paul II reaffirmed the need for a more nuanced concept of development is needed and it is hoped for. A true and integral development of individuals and people. And while he espoused the critical posture of the church towards both liberal capitalism and Marxist, Marxist collectivism, True conceptions of the very development of mankind and people, both imperfect and in need of radical correction, Pope John Paul II takes up then the sense of development in solitude Re socialis, and a few weeks before that, we witnessed something similar happening also on the level of the United Nations. So for Pope John Paul II, having inherited or in view of uh, capitalism and the Marxist uh, collectivism, which he considered to be two positions which are both imperfect and in need of radical correction. 
Capitalism and Marxist collectivism for John Paul II are imperfect and they need radical, uh, they need radical correction. And the type of radical correction that they need is what he would expound in Solicitude Re Socialis. But the interesting thing for us is that a few weeks just before Pope John Paul II signed this encyclical, we witnessed something also beginning in the United Nations. The United Nations created a report which was headed by Miss Brundtland. Some of you may recall that. They prepared a working group report on our common home, calling for a new sense of development. And because of some, for some, the Brutland Report, Our Common Home, was what gave birth to the UN concept of sustainable development, we shall look at the sense of development in the United Nations and in the church later. But let us recognize for now that it was the popes, of the, the popes of the Second Vatican Council who preceded the United Nations thinking about development and they preceded the UN by 20 years. Secondly, it is worth noting how shortly after the publication of the Brundtland Report of the UN, Pope John Paul II wrote, we must ask ourselves if the sad reality today is not at least in part the result of two narrow ideas about economics and development. Before explaining that economic and financial mechanisms can exacerbate the difference between the rich and the poor, stifling the latter, and at the same time, these mechanisms favoring the interests of those who operate them. Thirdly, let us also know that, <clears throat> that during the pontificate of John Paul II, the compendium of the social teaching of the church was also published, a collection of the church's social teaching in a coherent and consistent way. An introduction of that also bore this title, An Integral and Solidary Humanism. So the compendium refers to the expression intra-development uh, 15 times uh, in, in, in this whole booklet. This will be interesting because the Pope who will succeed John Paul II will take up this very seriously. This is Pope Benedict XVI. Benedict XVI enters this discussion with integral human development in love and in truth. And the thing again is for us to know that this encyclical, which we normally and popularly cite as Caritas in Veritate, has a full title. And the full title is Development, Integral Human Development in Caritas et Veritate, Integral Human Development in Love and in Truth. So the title of the encyclical is not simply Caritas in Veritate, but Integral Human Development in Caritas et Veritate. And this becomes the title again of this encyclical that Pope Benedict XVI would address. And this was to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Populorum Progressio and the 20th anniversary of Solicitude Rei Socialis. Therefore, Caritas in Veritate takes up the theme of development in a very crucial way, but develops the theme based on deep Christian anthropology. The crucial contribution of Caritas and Veritate to the discussion of development is the rootedness of development in the true sense of Christian anthropology, the sense of the human person, which, though fallen, is redeemed by grace, and therefore they, re they need to recognize that a true sense of human development responds to a vocation addressed to every person, and it's a vocation that can be responded to also in due recognition of the presence of the grace of God in the lives of people. This is why Pope Benedict would say that the true agents of development are those who know how to stand before God with arms lifted up in prayer. This is a language that you're not likely to see in the United Nations anywhere. 
To say that the true agents of development are people who know how to stand before God with hands raised in prayer. It's a recognition of the true sense of development also in this deep Christian anthropological sense. After, after Pope uh, Benedict comes Pope Francis. So between the popes, popes then who opened the council and the pope who closed it, an idea has been observed already about development is being born, which subsequent popes would develop and, uh, and, uh, and so flourish in the, the creation of this dicastery. Therefore, Pope Francis, 50 years later, would say that our faith in Christ, who became poor and was always close to the poor and outcast, is the basis of our concern for integral development of society. Thus, integral human development must be rooted in the right to life and more generally, in the, in the what we call the right to existence itself. It is in the third chapter of Lauda to See that Pope Francis notes how the dominant technocratic paradigm tends to dominate various spheres of human life, social, economic, ethical, and so on. Then he points out that the technological products are not neutral, for they create a framework which ends up conditioning human lives and lifestyles and not shaping social possibilities along the lines dictated by the interests of certain uh, powerful groups. So the technocratic paradigm extends its tentacles to economic spheres as well. And the economy accepts accept every advance in technology with a view to profit without concern for its potentially negative impact on the human beings. And so finance overwhelms the real economy and so on. Accordingly, Pope Francis would, 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 would teach, we have a sort of a deeper a super development of a wasteful and consumeristic kind of a culture which forms an unacceptable contrast with the ongoing situation of dehumanizing deprivation, which calls on us to effect a change. And so, responding to this call to effect a change, Pope Francis goes a step further and searches for a deeper conceptual root behind a very technocratic paradigm, and he notes the following. The basic problem goes even deeper. It is the way that humanity has taken up technology and its development according to an undifferentiated and one-dimensional paradigm. The problem ultimately has to do with a reductive perception of human development, wherein the human person is reduced to a mere consumer. The natural world is reduced to a mere object for human use and consumption, and consequently a conflictual relationship between humanity and the natural world is born. And so, Pope Francis writes, Human beings and material objects no longer extend a friendly hand to one another. The relationship has become confrontational. In the light of this, the fourth chapter, Pope Francis teaches the famous uh, characteristic uh, theme of his uh, encyclical, Integral, Eco Integral Ecology. And so in response to above reductive, reduct reductive philosophy, Pope Francis uh, goes on to elaborate the concept of integral ecology in the fourth chapter of his encyclical. And the, ongoing, and the opening paragraph of that encyclical states that everything is closely interrelated. And today's problems call for a vision capable of taking into account every aspect of the global crisis. And I suggest that we now consider some elements of an integrated integral ecology as a philosophical underpinning for Pope Francis' treatment of integral human development. The perception then of interdisciplinary connection among the different social questions encourage Pope Francis to reform the curia, and that's what has been talked about this morning, 
So the putting together not only of our dicastery, but also that of the family and the laity, and our own bearing the name of the, of the encyclical which began all of this, so for Paul the sixth. So integral human development then is about being and it's about becoming, rather than about having, having property, having wealth, or having anything. Development, therefore, must be promoted and measured according to all the dimensions of human existence, economic, political, cultural, ecological, historical, and spiritual. This idea, then, of development resonated with other alternative development models of that time, such as the one pioneered by David Goulet, and later on developed by Amartya Sen, and the United Nations Development Programs. Goulet had proposed that when promoting development, we must consider at least three basic components to complement material growth, namely life sustenance, concerned with the provision of basic needs such as housing, clothing, food, and minimal education. Secondly, self-esteem, concerned with the feeling of self-respect and independence. And thirdly, freedom, concerned with the ability of people to determine their own destiny. These alternatives and more holistic models of development still need, of course, an economic system that whilst promoting economic growth, it is still amenable to actual human progress. And so although it is not the task of the church to ideate about all of this, but the church has got a contribution to make, rooted in the tradition of its own development and understanding of what integral human development is from Pope John 23rd till the days of Pope Francis. So the current development, the current uh, economic model of development, as Pope Francis explains, raises numerous questions about its integrality and authenticity. In fact, because it foments exclusion and inequality, it corrupts the social nature of our existence. Also, being underpinned by the myth of individual autonomy, it belittles interpersonal bonds and the necessary communitarian dimension of, of, uh, of, the, of humans to flourish. The model is also inauthentic because it does not acknowledge the reality of the limits of prosperity. Following on, on critically then, the idols of Mammon, as Pope Francis would say, the current economic model of development is complicit in distorting the idea of the human person created in the image and likeness of God. And for these idols and their models, individuals are defined more according to their consumption power and to what they have and rather than according to what they really are. Therefore, we always invited by the church's own development of integral uh, human development in its tradition to see, the, to identify the real underpinning of our teaching about integral human development. How to create a holistic model of development that can guarantee the integral flourishing of the human person and all of the human being. How can we arrive at a paradigm of development capable of integrating economic, environmental, political, and social dimensions of our human existence as communitarian beings in our common planetary home. This is where a sense of theological anthropology makes a difference in our uh, discussion. So, two observations from here. We know that for us as a church, the talk about development is always began or premised by the affirmation of our human dignity, having been created in the image and the likeness of God. And so if the creation of uh, the human person, the image and likeness of God, establishes the dignity of every man, then the subsequent story 
of the brotherhood of Cain and Abel means that humanity is, uh, is created in a fraternity with a vocation to be fraternal, with a vocation to solidarity in the pursuit of the common good. In this sense, the brotherhood of the human race invites us to consider the fact that the word for brotherhood is Adelphos, right? And Adelphos means basically we're from the same womb. And it means that those who are from the same womb therefore share the same nature. It is not possible that people from the same womb have different natures. Therefore, the attribution of dignity to the human person, characterized as Adelphos or brothers, means that all of the, all human, all, all of the human species share and have the same dignity. Having the same dignity, therefore, it is impossible with such a universal scope to have somebody who realizes his dignity when there is another who does not realize its dignity. There is no I, I as an individual, who can live in full human dignity so long as there is another individual on the face of the earth who suffers the de degradation. The very existence of such others living in hardship and de degradation tells us that the social conditions are flawed, that there's something wrong, that development is not integral. So for development to be integral, it must ensure the dignity of all, all Adelphoi, all brothers and all who share the same nature bestowed on them by reason of creation by God. So the basic sense of a Christian anthropology, the fact that human beings created in image and likeness of God share the same nature, is very basic therefore to our discourse and conversation about the development, integral human development. Secondly, the underlying philosophy or metaphysics of integral ecology of Pope Francis Spurs has provides another underpinning for our talk about integral human ecology. It is the ontology of interrelatedness of the human reality and the interdependence of all created things. Pope Francis points out that human beings and all beings, for that matter, can exist only within a web of relationships. And so Laudato Si introduces integral ecology as a paradigm able to articulate the fundamental relationship of the person with God, with oneself, and with other human beings, and with the rest of creation. So the caring for the development of the person and of society cannot be disconnected from the caring for the earth. Social and ecological issues go hand in hand. The cry of the earth and the cry of the poor are interrelated. And we should listen to both if we are to respect the character of integral human development in order to pro promote uh, integral uh, development in, in, in all. But integral ecology is more than mere connection between the social and the environmental dimensions of our lives. It also includes the need to foster personal, social, and ecological harmony, for which we need personal, social, and ecological conversion, both individual and social. In fact, as Pope Francis points out, isolated individual conversion is absolutely necessary but not enough. Social problems, therefore, must be addressed by community networks and community conversion, and not simply by the sum of individual good deeds. This entails the need to change what St. John Paul II called the structures of sin in society. These are the structures that generate poverty, inequality, forced migration, and ecological damage. And so we should remind ourselves that if we aim at changing structures, we will, face with we, will fa we will be faced with numerous challenges. An important contribution then of academics to the study of integral human development then must delve into all of these. Christian anthropological basis, 
as well as if you want the metaphysics or the philosophical underpinning of Pope Francis teaching about the interrelatedness, interconnectedness of everything that exists. Now, here are some challenges with this understanding of integral human uh, development in response to what I was asked to address. The first challenge then that we can probably advert to is about dialogue and global governance. An integral model of development enlightened by an integral ecological view cannot be imposed, but just proposed. Therefore, as Lauda to see points out, we need the participation of all agents at all levels of the political realm, but especially the participation of those most affected by economic and ecological issues. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of dialogue for integral human development. First, because a dialogical approach is the one that can counter the attitude of dominion that is causing violence. Secondly, because an inclusive dialogue can counter the social exclusion that foments conflict. And thirdly, because when we dialogue, we are forced to go beyond our own self, our own selves, not to talk about self-interest, encountering the other and discovering the richness which we have in common. So in a dialogue then, the other is not an enemy, but a partner and a neighbor. Dialogue may be difficult, and sometimes in some cases, it's really difficult, especially when it is not limited to superficial negotiations, and when it addresses the structures that cause conflict. But it is precisely this dialogue through which we best deploy the idea of integral human development, when we open up to one another, which include both uh, but uh, uh, which includes but transcends nations. A concrete way then of supporting the dialogue on the issue is to intervene and support the dialogue at the international level as the agenda 2030, 2030 of the SDGs uh, seek to su uh, suggest. We also need to create different dialogical framework that can respond to different circumstances. Many places in the world do not have even formal structures for public dialogue. And to promote deeper public dialogue in democratic countries is becoming more difficult than ever. So the democratic component of what integral human development is all about is the fact that it, it assumes a dialogue that can exist through which people can talk and share, uh, share views and together come to promote a common good. A second challenge that I'd like to address is about the relations between economics and ecology. It is too easy to say that they need to come together. But when they collide, we experience, uh, our experience tells us that economics prevails over ecology. When leaders have to take decisions, they are pressured by economic interests and economic needs which are difficult to ignore. And so, for example, at the national level, how are our politicians going to fulfill the national commitment to the Agenda 2030 and, for example, even the Paris Agreement on Climate Change? If they want to do so, they will have to encourage the reduction of the fossil fuel industry which will create unemployment. Can they afford this? We all witness in how in many countries leaders are giving up to the development of the fracking industry or coal industry. When Lada Tesu was published, a region in Poland, for example, which depends on coal mines, uh, sent a small, uh, well, probably we shall not call it a protest. But, but the message came to, to our office that a region in Poland was worried about loud out as you calling for moving away from coal. And so it meant that we had to travel one day to this region in Poland to engage the community 
and to tell them that Pope Francis is not against their well-being and interests, and that the suggestion was to find alternative uses of coal if its burning is always you know, polluting the environment. And there are ongoing challenges organized between the University of Santa Croce and business communities in America, again, over the implications of loud that to see for certain economic decisions that involve fossil fuel, coal, and even oil. And so the tension can exist. Furthermore, how are local communities located at the ecological reservoir going to def defend their territory and culture if the country is able to generate income from natural resources located in their land? We can continue mentioning very many situations where economic and ecology are sometimes in tension or even conflict. So studying seriously how to deal with these tensions is another massive contribution uh, that uh, institutions of higher learning like this can undertake. A third challenge with which I'll conclude my small observation is related to the way we address time. As Lauda to see explains, one of the roots of the problem of the current development model is the expression coined by Pope Francis, rapidification. This means a part of development that prevents us from being attentive to the uh, real, uh, relationships that enable us to flourish as human beings. A speed of living and working that prevents us from being fully attentive to the cry of the earth and even the cry of our own nature. This is also connected to the prevailing short-term mentality, particularly dominant in business, communities, and sometimes even in politics, to the increasing pattern of consumption, which foment a throwaway culture that hinders relationship and hurts the earth. And so, how to de-accelerate? How can we slow down from the rapidification that Pope Francis talks about in business, in our own private lives, in, in, in our of consumption habits and all? How to work for the long term in all dimensions of existence? This is another topic that I think can be addressed. Let me then conclude these observations by simply recapping. The invitation to address the issue of integral human development invites us to recognize first and foremost that the term development is not used or spoken only by the church. Other institutions outside the church also use development. In that sense, what is the critical difference between the churches talk about development and other institutions talk about development? That invites us to visit how the term integral development evolved in the church's magisterium beginning with John the 23rd till Pope Francis. And there we find an integral human development that is rooted in Christian anthropology and that is rooted in uh, the close interrelatedness that Pope Francis talks about. That provides us with a basis for talk engagement in our conversations about integral human development in a way that promotes the well-being of the human person in the now and also in the future. And so on the 7th of December, 1965, while closing the Second Vatican Council, Pope Paul VI spoke of the church as the servant of humanity and declared that the church is entirely on the side of man and in his service. It is a service for the development of the entire human person and of the human being. And as he went on to say in 1967, in his encyclical letter, Populum Progressio, which, opened the follow, uh, which was opened with the following lines. The development of peoples has the church's close attention, particularly the development of those peoples who are striving to escape from hunger, misery, endemic disease, and ignorance, of those who are looking for a wider share in the benefits of civilization and a more active improvement of their human qualities, of those who are aiming purposefully at their complete fulfillment. So the division of integral human development presents, 
present in the embryonal form in the Poplum Progresso has now been developed into full flourishing in the magisterium of the church over the past 50 years, in particular in the social and sacred cause of the popes and has culminated in the creation of this new dicastery of the Holy See at the service of promoting, uh, at the service or promotion of integral human development. We are grateful for the Lord for this gift. Louder to see, maybe the Lord may, uh, may, you know, may the Lord be praised. And I'm also grateful also to all of you participants in this international conference who have come from far and near to discuss from an academic perspective, issues and challenges around integral human development. The church rules this in a very joining sense of theological or Christian anthropology and in the metaphysics of interrelatedness and interconnected life. It is my hope that following the same rootedness of this expression in genuine anthropology and the metaphysics of interrelatedness would also be able to, to answer and to deal with the challenges which arise from looking at uh, the uh, invitation or the vocation to integral human development. And with this, I wish this conference great success and may it bear fruit in abundance for all of you participants. Thank you.